people are looking for something that goes beyond just work. They're looking for something that makes what they do every day a more important part of who they are. When we started the company, we felt that there was a new energy that was emerging. In the last seven years we've grown, we're now in over 150 locations around the world. And what we found is that no matter where we go, the spirit of people for change and innovation is the same. When you go into a rework, there's an energy of people doing their own thing while actually still being part of something greater than themselves. We're as much a co-working space as Amazon is a book-selling store. When you think about the value of community and collaboration and having employees that are more engaged and are happier to go to work, that's something that is much bigger than real estate. This is something that's really key for WeWork is to elevate the people that are a part of the community and it's definitely impacted the way that I've been able to do business. Our goal is to think, one, how can we make you more successful? How can we help you on that path? But then two, how do we leverage the potential for connection? The collaborative energy that that creates is unique and I don't think you can get it anywhere else. We're not taking the traditional way of doing things. We'll put our own spin on it. The end product will be more authentic. That's one of the most fulfilling things for us as a company. It allows us to dream bigger about what we can provide. You as a person are sitting in a room with an extraordinary group of people. We literally become such good friends and I think that that just says a lot about WeWork. My team is my family. We can learn so much from each other. When they came to me, they told me this is a job where you could build something new. We're really engaging with this whole thing at a human level. I think we're all really lucky. It feels cool to be in a place that you're proud of and be making work that you're proud of and I think they just go hand in hand. It blows my mind every day that we work for a company that's all focused around love, letting people do what they love, letting people be who they are, accepting them for that, loving them for that. We're a company that wants to provide people with an energy source. We want to provide people with motivation, with excitement. We want them to love what they do. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miguel McKelvey to the stage. Hello. <laughs> wow, this is a great room. Happy to be here. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to talk today um, a little bit about our story at WeWork and also my story as a co-founder and my own journey uh, to how I recognized um, in many ways my own passions, my own interests and have figured out how to apply my energy uh, in the best way towards what we're doing as a company. Uh, like any startup founder knows, at the beginning you do so many different things. And for me, I was really a generalist. I could do a lot of uh, different things well. I could build websites, I could run QuickBooks, I could uh, design buildings, I could do logos. Um, I wasn't the best at all those things, but I could, uh, I could, I was functional. And over time, as we grew, we, hired people who are much better than me at pretty much everything. And so a couple years ago, I got to this point where I looked around and I said, you know, now that we've, uh, we're, we're growing incredibly quickly, we have uh, a thousand employees, you know, we've been able to attract talent, and what is there left for me? You know, do I just um, fade away? Uh, do I spend my time only, you know, telling the WeWork story, which is a, a, an important thing to do, but certainly not from when you're a hard-working person, when you've been someone who's worked hard on delivering you know, tangible results in the context of a business, that was a challenging place to be. And so one of the things I started doing was talking to people, talking to our team members, and trying to understand you know, what did they need? What was the thing in this incredibly challenging environment where we're you know, hiring 50 new people a week and growing all over the world? For those of you who aren't familiar with the WeWork story, you know, we started in New York City and one building in Soho, and we quickly um, grew across the United States. And then, you know, from now we're in, uh, I think, over 60 countries. And I just came back from China and Singapore, where we're um, growing incredibly quickly. And so, in this ever-changing environment where things are challenging, where there's difficulties on multiple levels, 
you know, what could I do as a founder, as a co-founder, as a person who could really choose um, where to apply my energy, what would I do? And what kept coming to me was this feeling that people in our company, and I think in the world in gener general, their ideal state is to be in a place of happiness, in a place of engagement. And we talk about that a lot, you know, engagement, how engaged are your employees? And what does that really mean? And what I got to was that being engaged, enjoying your work, is about being in a place of love. And when that came to me, I actually struggled with it a lot because, you know, love is a big word, and we don't normally talk about it at work. And, um, and it's... And, and it made me nervous, you know? It scared me a little bit to start talking about love, and I think that's got me excited as well, because I figured if I'm nervous about it, if I feel uh, that this is a hard thing to talk about, then it's probably a struggle for a lot of others, and that if we can figure something out uh, about it, that we could, it would help a lot. And so um, I came up with this diagram. I, I was just sketching on paper, and I said, what's the goal? The goal is for everything in your life to move into a place of love. And then what are the aspects of your life? There are different components of your life that are um, you know, yourself and the way you exist in the world, the, the world around you and politics and you know, all social media and all these things that are swirling and are impacting you in a day to day. And then your friends and your family, the people that you uh, are connected to in the deepest way. And then, of course, your work, and that's where you spend a huge amount of your time, where most of us spend a huge amount of our time every week is actually in the workplace. And so when you get, when you start looking at these things diagrammatically, you find that there's all these different nodes that exist um, in this diagram. And they, each one of them has the potential to either uh, help you move into this place of love or keep you from being there. And and all these aspects of your life are constantly in play. They're constantly um, uh, contributing to this feeling that you have of like, am I happy? Am I feeling energized? Am I excited about life? And for us as people who build companies, for those of us who have the chance to have an impact on the people that are around us, the best case scenario is that we're helping people move into this place of love. And so in the context of work, we, were, we looked very deeply into uh, what are all of the ways that we can have an impact? And then what are the blockers? What are the things that keep us um, from getting into this place of love? And it's crazy when you think about it. You know, at work, there are so many things that can influence you. It's like, you know, we had some experiences where uh, we talked to people, and if, you're, if they were unhappy with their compensation or unclear on their compensation, that's constantly bothering them and distracting them from doing a good job. You know, something like, this is one that seems stupid, but it's like the air conditioning, the, the ventilation, you know, if you're too cold or too hot, you know, something like that is actually could be, for some people, they're so sensitive to it that it could be keeping them, you know, from being excited about coming to work in the morning. And then, of course, there's the much bigger picture things like the mission and the purpose and the why you're, you're there and how connected do you feel to that. And I think that's one of the things more than ever these days people want to be connected to that why. And of course, there's lots of great TED Talks and um, YouTube videos about how people connect to that purpose. And, and so you have this incredible spectrum of things that you have to manage. And I was trying to figure out, like, what, how? Like, OK, there's so much complexity to this. And human beings are so weird. Like, every one of you guys is a weirdo in your own way, right? And so how does a company reconcile this relationship with all these people who are all unique and all have their own challenges and their own opportunities to be motivated? And, and so the only way I could see to solve this was to actually come up with a methodology of, of, of working on it. And the aspiration for this comes from this idea that we're a quickly growing company. We're a quickly evolving company. And we're never going to be the same tomorrow as we are today. And in order to uh, grow and evolve and become better every day, we had to operationalize. We had to be specific in the way we address culture, just like we would about any other aspect of the business. And when you think about that, it's, it's super interesting to try to uh, formalize a relationship to culture and to do it in a way that's tactical, you know, strategy and tactics and goals, just like anything else, because 
culture is often thought to be this very ephemeral thing. But what we found is that by breaking down culture into um, these pillars, these eight pillars which we identified, we could very quickly um, take things, feedback that we were getting, inputs that we're getting from our employees, from conversations that we're having, from events that are happening, from you know, milestones in the company, we could process them through this OS and then actually um, uh, ideally create a culture output. And so the change that, that happened for us is um, we look at culture as a whole bunch of inputs that are organized under with this methodology and then we, through a method of initiatives to affect the culture, we can then think of culture as an output. And so while culture remains this energy that surrounds us, this very you know, ephemeral thing, you can actually move it and improve it and make it better in a, in a proactive way. And so um, that's what we've been working on. It's been since the first time I gave this talk about love to the whole company, it was about uh, a little bit more than a year ago. Um, and it was you know, doing that, standing in front of a group of 2,000 people as a person in business, as a co-founder, and talking about love was actually really terrifying, but it was also galvanizing for us because it gave us um, a reason for a lot of the things that we've just done uh, intuitively, instinctually. And so just to touch on a couple of those things, um, from the beginning at WeWork, uh, we started doing this summer camp event where we would bring all of our employees as well as a lot of our members to this children's summer camp uh, up in the summer. So the kids would leave and then we would come the next week and we, we ran it just like uh, the way the camp did with the counselors and the food and all that. And then we added this music component so we would have live music performances in the evenings. And it became a time for connection where people you know, expanded their relationships. And this is something that's very important you know, for, for real human connection is to have multi-dimensional relationships, not just seeing someone in one context, but giving the opportunity for people to experience um, uh, people in, in a way that you perhaps wouldn't get in a normal day today. So you know, you, one time you're uh, at work whatever, talking about data in a spreadsheet, and then another time you're doing archery together or you're trying to sail a little boat in the lake together. Uh, obviously, sharing those experiences, um, when you layer them on top of each other, those relationships become so much deeper. And so we've focused a lot in that connection aspect um, and in trying to figure out how to maximize it. And, and I think so far um, it's been one of the things that we're really good at, and it's essential for us because what we really sell is culture when it comes down to it. So we're, people will think of us as a workspace solution, but the reality is, what do people get from what we do? They get a feeling, they get an energy. When they walk into one of our, our buildings, it's, of course there's a, a practical element to having a place to work and you know, a desk, but when people love we work, it's because of this environment, this energy that they connect to. And a lot of that comes from our community management teams and, and they have to come in every day with positivity and energy and ex excitement. And so for them to be in that place of love, they have to be, it has to be reinforced you know, every day by the environment that they work in, by their connection to the company and the company's purpose, by their belief that they're a part of something greater than themselves. And so it's our job uh, for us to be able to provide that to our community management teams and then for them to be able to provide that to all the members in our buildings, they have to feel that they have to be this, these beacons of positive, positive energy. And you know, these are people who are distributed across the whole world and they're doing this in so many different you know, cultures from, like I said, in Shanghai and Singapore to you know, Buenos Aires and London and Tel Aviv. So it's, you know, we're bridging this, in, this global uh, community and um, trying to connect people to this energy source, which then they can then share. So now we've achieved this le level of success. You know, people look to us as, um, in some ways, an example of someone who's become successful in a very complicated time. You know, we're thought of as some people will say, "Oh, you guys have figured out the millennial problem." You know, people love working for you. Um, how did you do that? You know, what's your secret? And of course starts with space for us. I mean, we, we, we're, we're, we started out in the space business and in, in the conversion of you know, the energy that comes from uh, places like this and in the photograph, you know, where uh, I've heard the statistic recently that you know, up to 70% are 
looking for a new job at any given time. I think a lot of that can be attributed to the environments that people work in. And so just us figuring out how to do that better, um, creating these places where people feel like the environment is supportive, that it's uplifting, that they can walk in the morning and feel excited about their life and their work, that's, um, that, that's become obviously what we're known for. But then, you know, what we're trying to do is take that to a new place, and this is really our next level future, is figuring out how do we take what we've learned and what we've done, and again, um, the impact that we can have on people and help make it transferable and help other companies learn how not only can they you know, come into a WeWork space and that that can be meaningful for their cultural evolution, but then what can we layer onto that? What can we help them learn about connecting their employees, about uh, helping you know, them devise ways of um, connecting their employees to their purpose and, and their why? And that's what I think um, we're super excited about. I'm personally excited about it because for me as a co-founder, but now a chief culture officer, our ability to affect the world in a positive way will come from these relationships where, you know, we started where people came into WeWork and they're inside of our four walls and now we have over 200,000 of those people around the world. But when we're able to give some of that to other companies that might have, you know, 50,000 or 200,000 employees themselves, that actually helps us have an impact that can, you know, be multiplied much quicker than we can build new locations. And so that's the path that we're on. It's, it's a complicated and interesting one. And so for me, I'm engaging in a new way in trying to learn, trying to grow myself, you know, whether that's um, reading you know, latest uh, books or listening to the latest TED Talks and trying to remain in this dialogue. Um, I'm, I get to be in a real deep engagement with these issues because, like I said, they're, they're ever-changing. So with that, I would love to introduce you guys to Sarah Lewis. She is a writer and also a professor at Harvard, and she's one of the people that um, I've connected to in my own path towards learning, and so uh, I'd like to introduce her, and we're gonna have a conversation about some of these topics, and hopefully we'll all learn together. Sarah? Good to see you. They wanted me to sit on this side. Do they? Okay, there yeah. we go. All that was right. the only rule they gave me. <laughs> Lots of rules, yeah. Okay. So, hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Oh, my pleasure. Really an honor. So, this is an interesting place to be for both of us. I mean, I'm like a, you know, an entrepreneur, um, not an academic. Um, I actually have very little, um, I would say, formal education in anything that, um, aside from just you know, my own discovery through intuition uh, when it comes to culture. And so reading your book um, was especially interesting for me because you take some things that are, uh, I think, often thought of as ephemeral and then uh, find examples where they've actually become tangible and meaningful. So I wondered if you, in a very general sense, could just say how would you define what culture is in, mm -hmm. in the current context? Yeah. Oh, just a small question. <laughs> and it's a deeply important one, I think, especially today. I think the most succinct way to describe it is to consider culture as the condition through which we create energy, right? And that's applicable to the world that I'm in and the world that, that you're in. When I say conditions, I mean the environment, what lets you develop, what lets you grow, right? And, there, and therefore become something else as a result. We, we measure culture in lots of different ways. We often use the term with a capital C when we're thinking about, say, the arts, right? But what we're really honoring when we talk about the arts is their power to move us and to thereby create conditions in us that we didn't think possible before. I think culture with a smaller C has to do also with interactions and exchanges, yes, in the world of entrepreneurship, but even far beyond that, you know? what allows for this to become the kind of mode of engagement is a cultural phenomenon, right? People speaking, people listening, this is an act. But the work that I do studies how these cultural shifts have impacted justice over time, have impacted citizenship and group notions of belonging. So in that context, I mean, I love the distinction between, you know, the, the capital C culture, yeah. because there is something that I think a lot of people think culture can be inaccessible in a way, yeah. and uh, yeah. especially on that 
like more artistic level, you know, sometimes you can just think, you know, culture is now summed up by going into a museum and taking a selfie with like a famous painting, you right. know? Right. But how do you, how does that flow into, you know, the real life of, say, a company? Like, mm -hmm. how, where's the mm -hmm. intersection where it's like, mm -hmm. you take a picture of that building full of cubicles and it's so bland and probably nothing in that environment is like moving you mm -hmm. to the comparison to where, you know, art in the past would hopefully inspire this like powerful response, you yeah. know? They're so separate, yeah. but yet they, you would think that there would be a more, a, a more meaningful yeah. overlap. Absolutely. Oh, so many things to say. Well, first of all, this is why I'm so thrilled we're speaking. You, you're creating the culture within we work and the different cultures that you're then able to impact through architecture, through the design of the space, through uh, the modeling that goes into anticipating how we want to interact in a space. But this, this has happened, the, the way in which culture has let us actually shift our notion of belonging, I think has happened historically over time in ways that we don't uh, account for. I'll just give you one uh, Austin-based example, actually, that, you, that you've maybe read about in The Rise. Uh, and this is one of the things that inspired me to write the book. I learned about a young boy who went to a high school dance here in Austin uh, in the 1930s. And he was really just trying to meet some girls at this dance, you know, as one does, right? And he instead found himself just struck still by this trumpet player he'd never heard of before. And it turns out that it was Louis Armstrong, and it was 1931, segregated America. And this is a boy, a white boy, and he understood that there was genius coming out of this man's horn. And he knew in that moment that if this was the case, then segregation had to be wrong. This man became one of the lawyers for Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court case that outlawed segregation. And he inaugurates the moment that he started walking towards that path of justice with that high school dance, with that moment, with that trumpet player. And he went on to teach constitutional law at Columbia and at Yale. And he would hold this annual Armstrong listening night to honor this man who had this life-changing uh, shift for him in his life. So culture, you could see in that m example, there's big C culture on the stage, but there's also just this very internal shift that happens, a kind of small C culture that can become, again, the sort of condition that changes one's own energy and that can then change <laughs> the very communal energy that lets us all sit here today. So it's a powerful concept. It's a, you know, I can't make a comparison because that's a profound story, but I will say in our case, you know, very early on, we included music in, in our events, in our, our summer camp, for example, mm -hmm. and we actually invested a lot in it. So for example, our summer camp is a few thousand people. I think last year in London, it was maybe 5,000, but you know, we've had artists like Florence and the Machine, The Weeknd, Snoop Dogg, um, I'm trying to think, Macklemore this year. We've had um, Michael Franti, who's an uh, amazing artist. And, yeah. it, and it's, it's yeah. amazing how, really regardless of the content of, of the music, mm -hmm. the fact that you share this energy with a group yeah. of people um, can be so powerful. And you see people, you know, their stories yeah. afterwards are like, they're in disbelief mm -hmm. that their company party featured one of these um, <laughs> artists. Yeah. And I think the reason why we do that is because it does there is something transcendent mm -hmm. that connects people in these environments that, um, and work doesn't give that to you usually. You know, it's not a normal, I mean, yeah. in your job, does Harvard um, have shows with these awesome artists? <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you a funny story though? The, yeah. the short answer is yes, but it used to be no. When I, I went to Harvard as a, as a kid too, and I was really frustrated that there was no live music at Harvard. So I spent my time, I guess a little, little entrepreneur, trying to raise money to get Harvard to put on live shows. So our first show was the Black Eyed Pea and the Roots. And no I, way. I raised money to do oh, that. Wow. And now it's become Yard Fest, and now we have, but, but normally, no, we don't have a lot of live music. And it is the, the key to what creates a community. It really, it, so whether it's a Louis Armstrong or whether it's, I mean, The weekend, they're all, I think, crucial for the work that they do in each generation. Because um, oftentimes it's these little private moments that you never know are going to ignite something radical and huge within a larger group of people. So speaking of that, I mean, one of the things that you touch on in the book is, you know, the creative process and how, I mean, we're talking about yeah. 
you know, genius in some cases, and how do you, how do these transcendent moments happen where people come up with, and I think a lot of people think of it um, as uh, you have to be just your mind is somehow better than everyone else's or something, but yet you describe things where a lot of times the people are you know, failing consistently, mm -hmm. and that's actually how they reach this great result at one point. Yeah. Um, is that like, is that genius idea, you know, transferable to a group of people, to a company? Mm -hmm. Have you seen examples where, mm -hmm. where that can happen? Absolutely. I, again, it's what got me so excited when I was writing the book. I, I think I grew up with this idea of the lone genius model uh, as one to accept and to try to strive to emulate. But I realized as I was looking at, at Nobel Prize winning discoveries that were impacting um, innovation in all kinds of industries, or I was looking at uh, creativity more broadly defined, that model I realized just didn't work. In the end, what I found is that over a range of different industries, you find that people are, are, are creating a culture that lets people kind of toggle between having a, a, an immersive environment that's really a smaller percentage of their time, maybe 10, 15% of their time, where they can take risks in a safe way, um, and then a larger time spent being able to download and share ideas. And you, and you see this toggle back and forth happen among them. So whether it's in the field of physics to uh, Silicon Valley, you see this kind of calibration model at work. But it does require that people break out of this idea of thinking about the lone genius model as the only way to go. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's also, in my experience, with the co-founder or the founder of a company idea, you know, yeah. I, it, it hurts me, you know, I'm sure that Steve Jobs was incredible and an amazing, you know, person. Yeah. but they make it seem so singular that he invented a company or invented, you know, changed the world so singularly, yeah. and yet it was yeah. definitely a we effort. I mean, mm -hmm. there has to be hundreds mm -hmm. and thousands of people who contribute yeah. to that and, and, mm -hmm. and the environment that they have to create for that innovation to yeah. come out. I, I, I wish that story mm -hmm. would be told uh, more, and perhaps yeah. you know, in that case, um, some of those things are secretive, like companies don't want to always explain their secrets. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of secrets, they told me I was supposed to mention Slido, and I totally forgot because I was nervous when I um, came on stage. So if you do, we're going to have questions later. Um, if you do have any questions, you can use Slido to, 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 to submit them. So I'm um, sorry I forgot that, guys. Um, so I, one of the, the concepts, I mean, you in the book um, reference this idea of aesthetic force. Yeah. And yeah. that term, mm -hmm. I had never heard it before, and mm -hmm. I loved it because uh, it, it, in today's world, we are so overwhelmed by images, by ideas, um, by social media, by BuzzFeed, whatever it is. And I wonder, you know, what are the things that can actually move someone? You know, is aesthetic force possible in today's world when you're so oversaturated? Like, are there moments that people actually feel wow, feel mm -hmm. wonder? Mm -hmm. And can they move culture forward, you know? Yeah. Is that possible now? Yeah, yeah this is, uh, I wrote this chapter about aesthetic force as the final chapter in this book, and it was then that I realized what I was actually writing about, you know? Uh, I was thinking about the power of innovators uh, and the importance of failure in their journeys, but I think the payoff of writing the book was to understand that these path-breaking innovations, whether it is creating or reshifting how it is that we work, right, with a company like yours, I, I would call what you do a, a creative act, or looking at the work of an extraordinary painter, you name it, that the payoff is being able to shift us so, so radically that we shift maybe even our sense of purpose and our sense of possibility, certainly. And that impact is what I describe as aesthetic force. So in, as I was arriving at that term, I had just actually learned about that Louis Armstrong, Charles Black story I told you. And there was no other word I could think of to describe what it must have been like for that 16-year-old boy to realize that his entire world view was just completely wrong. Uh, but aesthetic force, because, well, Two things. One, I think we often see culture or the arts as very ephemeral, right? Not something that has gravitas or weight or power. And in fact, what I learned from that story is that it does. 
And it does in ways that are oftentimes deeply private, and that's why we don't often ascribe culture as having power. You know, it's it's within us. It's kind of individuated. But I also wanted to to find a way to describe that it has also a kind of a sharp, blunt edge to it. Right? It can actually torque things, move things. So this is ultimately what drives my work, wanting to understand what that force can go in the purpose of and how we can start to, as you're doing with, with Culture OS, really think about how we can kind of operationalize it in different ways. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I feel excited about, you know, from, from, from an intuitive sense. Yeah. I feel like I'm still on a journey towards figuring stuff out and I'm always, you know, I feel like a sponge that's trying to absorb as much as possible yeah. and then hopefully at some point output stuff that has an impact. Yeah. And uh, th that connects to another idea, which is that, you know, sometimes we think about like our growth in becoming better at what we do mm -hmm. um, towards, you know, some idea of like completion or becoming an expert or something. Right. And for me, I. I feel like the best when I'm still at the sharpest learning curve. Like when I, I feel overwhelmed by things coming at me that I don't understand and I don't know how to adjust to, mm -hmm. that's when I feel like I'm at my best in, in coming up with this creativity. And so I always tell, I do the new employee orientation every week and I say, you know, you might look at us as a company and say, whatever, we have a big valuation and we've got, you know, 4,000 something employees and you think that we've achieved something in the world. But the reality is we're still at day one. Like, we're still figuring this whole thing out. And I truly believe that because, you know, we have 200,000 members and we're successful, but like 200,000 members in the whole world, if we're going to get to 2 million one day, 200,000 is essentially zero on that, um, you know, spectrum. So if you imagine what it's going to take from here to there, we have so much more to learn. We, we're, we're still so much at the beginning. Right. Um, but how do you, you know, how do you remain in that sense of, of feeling like you've got to grow when the world kind of tells you, stick your chest out and say you're an expert, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Well, it gets back to, I mean, it's, it's such an important conversation to have because it gets back to this need to calibrate. But here in the context of calibrating between being an expert and letting yourself be what I like to call a deliberate amateur. So another thing I was surprised to find when I, I interviewed over I mean, 200 different individuals for, for this book over the course of about five years and realized that those who we deem to be experts considered themselves, in fact, deliberate amateurs, mm -hmm. and that's what got them to that place. Um, my favorite um, interview was with the Nobel Prize winning physicist Andre Geim, who's based in Manchester, and he's known for discovering graphene, the thinnest material known to man, strongest material known to man. And he found it through asking questions that experts wouldn't dare, right? By being willing to seem wrong and finding a way to save haven the risk taking required to live out the potential answer in, in the lab in his case. So he, he inaugurated this time where he let himself deliberately ask amateurish questions as Friday night experiment time, like FNEs. And a lot of companies, I mean, Google is probably most famous for the 20% time, have created something like that, analogous to that, and I wonder if maybe you think about that in your work at WeWork. But being an amateur is, is key. Having, and it connects to this idea of aesthetic force too. There's a sense of wonder and possibility that we associate with being a child. And that's what we're trying to tap back into because we understand that that's where the new paths will come. There are lots of other psych terms I could bore us with that, that teach us why expertise can actually be a handicap. Um, there's this, it basically has to do with this idea of dysfunctional persistence. Experts often believe that what they know has worked in the past will work again, mm. and it can block possibility, and it really can become a handicap. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I think getting people to be willing to let go mm -hmm. is as important as anything in a creative process. Yeah. Actually, if you haven't read Sarah's book, the, the graphene story is super cool, and I have an um, eight-year-old son, yeah. and I told him both what graphene was and yeah. the example of if you made a car 
you know, out of graphene, you could like drive it through a brick wall, but mm -hmm. it, you could like pick it up with one hand or whatever. And then um, I also told them it was discovered basically through this process with like scotch tape. And it's, yeah. it's this super yeah. bizarre story yeah. um, that was really cool and it's yeah. um, really relatable for, for a kid who, yeah. when you're talking about this like creative mm -hmm. process. So if you haven't, um, you should check it out. Yeah. So um, I, 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 I think that this, like one of the contexts for remaining, you know, in this process of evolution mm -hmm. yourself is in being in a culture of change and acknowledging that change can be a good thing. Mm -hmm. And for us as a company, again, it's like one of the struggles between trying to like get all the systems in place to be like a mature company and you know, all of our whatever ratings from the accountant firms and all that stuff have to be in place and mm -hmm. you, know, you wanna always like have everything documented so you can feel like you're doing things in the right way. But then, you know, for Adam and I, um, I think we both thrive in this culture that's kind of chaotic. Like we prefer to be, um, you know, it's a big reason why we've entered new markets as fast as we can because we want to be constantly learning. And so, um, you know, is that like okay for people? Because there's some people are terrified by change, yeah. you know, they want yeah. things to be the same. Are we doing yeah. them, you know, uh, psychological distress by making them <laughs> change all the time? No, I think you're, you're actually creating a new model and you're, you're creating perhaps a new path that people will understand as the, the one to consider as opposed to the, the expertise-based kind of lone genius model we were talking about earlier. The Andre Geim graphene example sort of bears out why change is so important. When he was doing these Friday night experiments, some of which, by the way, got him ridiculed and, and laughed at, he won, before winning the Nobel Prize, the Ig Nobel Award given to scientists <laughs> whose work is so outlandish, it first makes you laugh and then makes you think. And people are given two weeks to decide whether or not they want to accept it because you're roasted at, up at Harvard, actually, in front of a thousand people. But he was, he was there because everything that he did that let him eventually win a prize was a function of change. It was a function of going to another discipline and figuring out what experts weren't asking and then deciding what they should be asking and freeing themselves up enough to live out the answer and doing it again and again and again. If one can withstand the, <laughs> the amount of inputs you're going to have to handle to constantly be a deliberate amateur, uh, then yes, it is the path. It takes more capacity, it takes more imagination, and I think, frankly, it takes more self-belief and, and trust in your partners and in yourself. Yeah, I think that's the thing is that people in that context will often ask themselves, like, when is it gonna be over? You know, right. like, when, like, we know <laughs> right. this is really hard right now, we yeah. understand we're in the startup, but like, you know, when's yeah. the finish line in that phase? And right. I think that's a, an interesting dynamic to try to help people reconcile um, yeah. that comfort that you get from doing the same thing over and over again, exactly. where you like feel really good, I figured it out, I yeah. get to repeat myself, yeah. with then like, oh my God, I'm repeating myself, I can't take this, I'm so bored, you know? Right. And that's when like, right. for a lot of people in that 70% looking for a new job, it's mm -hmm. like when they're gonna be, you know, tired of what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it, it's, it's, that's a, such an interesting dynamic to continue to try to figure out and, mm -hmm. you know, on the fly. Mm -hmm. Um, we have some questions. Um, you guys have submitted some. Uh, I think that we should um, answer, do any of these appeal to you particularly? Let's take a look here. I like this, um, the middle one. Exactly, yeah. Uh, should I read it? What kinds of yeah. things do you, do you do to create a culture for your teams, given that your teams are delivering the culture for your customers? Uh, i.e. tenants, although we call them members. Um, this is a really interesting one. I mean, I brought this up um, earlier because I think what we're trying to shift to from a value perspective is really the culture. Like, we want people, mm -hmm. well, it sounds weird, to be our members, to be our customers yeah. because they're, like, buying culture from us. And that's not, I mean, I don't know of another business model that works that same way. Um, and... So I do think there are companies where perhaps, you know, if you 
buy ice cream from Ben and Jerry's, I mean, I'm sure it tastes really good, but then there's this layer where you're kind of like, you know, endorsing them as a company and a culture because perhaps you believe in, you know, their why. And that's mm -hmm. part of our conversation these days. But like, do you, do you feel like you're buying culture from anyone? Like, you know, do, do, are your relationships with companies um, mm. also have to do with the culture that they have? No, I hadn't thought about it until we started talking, really. That I do, I do value cultures based upon who I'm giving my, my money to in terms of how I choose even the coffee shop I'm going to go to to write something is a statement not really on what tea they have or coffee they have, but what, what culture I think I'm going to get from the hour I might spend there. And so, I mean, one of the reasons that I think actually, despite academia being what it is, that I, I do enjoy being at Harvard is that it does create the kind of culture that lets me do what I want to do. So I do, maybe I'm buying, even though they're paying me, I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> buying into the, their culture for sure. Uh, and I love what you're creating at, at WeWork. But this idea that it's constantly in sh flux and shifting is what I think is the real work of your work. How to Does that feel that way at Harvard, for example? Is it a, as an organization, are they always changing, evolving? Because, you know, yeah. they've done pretty yeah. well. Yeah. They could, <laughs> they could probably stay the same. Yeah, yeah, no, I joke. I should kind of go into <laughs> brand management now that I'm starting to think about Harvard as an object, as a cultural object. And it's one of the few brands that probably will really, <laughs> I think, ha has lasted. It's older than, than the United States, we know. Um, it's shifting, definitely, in part because of the way that students are working and how much that has pushed a very brick and mortar, constrained, um, almost museum-like kind of campus to reconsider itself. What would a WeWork space look like at Harvard? Well, it wouldn't work at Harvard. We need to build a new space. So they have to kind of expand into more of Boston. So it's something the administration is really grappling with, and it's not actually so, so easy. It's creating a two-model culture, in a, in a sense. We'll see how it works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, we were, I'm curious in general. I mean, education is obviously a super interesting space, and yeah. we're just starting a relationship um, mm -hmm. with that. We acquired a company uh, that uh, is doing you know, Coding Academy Flatiron, and then yeah. we're also yeah. launching a um, which is crazy, uh, uh, elementary school. Mm -hmm. um, right. Primarily because you know we've we're super interested in our own process and how we continue to evolve and how we can mm -hmm. promote that amongst um, our members and our members' families. And yeah. so it's that's a whole another layer. But when we mm -hmm. all are lucky, for us, we're lucky enough to be um, engaging in. Um, let me look for another question. What surprised you the most as you started to operationalize the WeWork culture? Any key yeah. learnings? I think this is a great question because for a lot of you out there who are in business, you know, you can look around um, whether you're, you know, a founder or a CEO or you're, you know, just started uh, yesterday. You can look around and um, and see things that are not the best, you know, mm -hmm. that 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 could be improved, and they are so broad. There, you know, it's like. Some people are super keyed in on very small details, mm -hmm. and then and and other people are motivated by big picture things, and that's what they care about the most. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you how can you address such a broad spectrum? Mm -hmm. And I think it's really you know mm -hmm. the reality is these are um, these are human questions. Like yes. you know, for you, yes. um, what are the things that you care about? And this is one of, one of the things I was interested in in art mm -hmm. is like. I've had the, 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 I had a girlfriend um, one time, we used to argue about this thing all the time, mm -hmm. whether it was better, if you, if you had money to give, would you give it to the arts, like supporting you know, the big foundations that support the arts, or would you like, buy organic milk? You know? And it's like, because you could get milk for half the price, right? Uh -huh. And so it was like this, or, or a ton of other, say, humanitarian organizations that are perhaps you know, feeding the poor or something like this. So you mm -hmm. have this like, spectrum of choices. And to me, it's like, we think of arts always as this very high end, almost like nice right. to have in life. Right. But your work suggests that these are actually the things that matter the most. The things that push humanity forward yeah. are, are the arts, you yeah. know? And so, yeah. Yeah. How do you make that choice? Absolutely. Well, I, should I guess which one you chose, which one, which one your girlfriend chose? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's in, the, in this case, the, the only, um, we're still in the argument, different girlfriend, but, um, <laughs> but I'm still in the, in the argument. You know? uh -huh. It's been it's undecided. 
Well, no, but it's a real question. Um, but one thing we have, we have so much to discuss. We haven't discussed that the arts really do function in this gift economy, right? They, and that's why the value upon them is incalculable. I mean, the, the gift economy means that we, we determine its value in the financial sense, but there's something incalculable about the experience that you have. How do you quantify what happened to Charles Black by listening to Louis Armstrong, or what shifts in the mind of a founder by being inspired by being in one of your spaces or being in the uh, you know, X coffee shop in X space? You can't, and this is what makes the work of people who are in the arts, I think, so kind of noble, right? You're arguing for something that you can't quantify, but we all know is important. Uh, and, and you're also able to advocate for something that can have tangible change that you can point to. So I don't know where I would come down on, on your question, uh, which is the answer, although I think I know. But one of, as I see it, being able to distinguish between the gift economy and the other economy is one of the ways that we can understand why the arts and why culture itself, big C and small c, doesn't quite get the recognition that it deserves. How do you, do you consume art in your daily, weekly, monthly life? Do you have any yeah. discipline where you yeah. interact with it or consume it in some way? I do. You know, I used to, before going to Harvard, I was a curator at the Tate Modern and at MoMA. And so my days were mainly structured around studio visits. So time in, in the museum, but time to see what we should be bringing into the museum also. And studio visits are really intimate uh, interactions, especially when you're seeing an artist whose work, say, will have their retrospective at MoMA or at the Tate, they oftentimes will show you what they want you to see, but will try to secret away what they don't. And mm. <laughs> it's often those back turned paintings that you really want to explore and want to check out because that indicates the near win of that, the fa failure of that, suggests where they want to go. So I try to make time to have a studio visit practice on a weekly basis despite the fact that I'm doing different work because I'm still writing about artists and I'm still curating shows and, and writing books. So that's one thing I do, but I, I don't have it regimented by discipline. It's what interests me mainly. Yeah, that, you know, for me, I think there's an interesting challenge in figuring out uh, how do you continue to um, involve yourself in, you know, an, in something that does can seem indulgent, you know, right. and it, and it's right. hard to like if you've got a lot of work to do, if you feel like you have a to-do list, then right. how do you balance that with these? You know, it's like are you going to put look at paintings or listen to great music, you know, on your to-do list? And right. when we're so busy all the time, and then so many things are sort of at your fingertips and on demand, you always think oh, I can do that later. Yeah. And so um, it's it, it's something that I think many of us could could do better would be to try to, again, it's weird to say it, operationalize love. It's like some of these things you have to operationalize yeah. to actually connect to yeah. them, especially if they're ephemeral. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I feel like um, for myself, um, remaining connected to culture, and even like something like discovering music is, is, yeah. is really hard. I used to go down to the, you know, CD store in the old days on a Saturday morning and like, a listening station, listen to like, you know, 10 things I, I haven't heard. And now it's like, you know, that's all done for me on Spotify. I can just mm -hmm. like fast forward through tracks if right. I'm not interested. Yeah. And it just feels, it's not, I don't invest in as much into it, but um, I don't know the answer yeah. to it. I'm just uh, wondering, like, huh. yeah. do you, do your students feel, for example, like they're different than perhaps you were when you were a kid? in this way. Yeah, well, I certainly feel that I'm different than they were. I don't know that they think that they're different <laughs> from how uh, we are now, for sure. But you know, your, your comment about filtering and, and finding things, happening upon things, I think has made me think differently about the, the culture that we're creating within workspaces. I, mean, I definitely found a ton of things by going to bookstores, by browsing. I mean, as an author, you need that. Being in libraries, musicians do the same thing. Um, Wynton Marsalis inspired a lot of my book. He would do the same thing with musicians. So if we're not doing that as much, because as we know from the Harari book we're reading, do Homo Deus and Sapiens, the algorithms are doing a lot of the human work for us, that, also, that it's actually the personal network, the human network that does that filtering. So the way in which we're actually arriving at culture <laughs> is through a kind of physical culture that we're creating for ourselves. 
That's actually, there's a question up here. How do you infuse and share your culture with remote employees? How do you include them when they're not physically in the space where culture is most potent? Yeah. I, that's a super interesting question, especially in this context of, you know, spaces can be powerful. Obviously, when you walk into a space, you can feel something, and that's something we've worked really hard to create. And we're lucky because our business is one of, you know, building physical yeah. spaces. Yeah. But we do, um, but this question does come up of, you know, how do you include people? If you want to reach more people, yeah. you know, can you create, is there a digital media mm -hmm. that actually feels highly connective yeah. that does um, connect people? And I will mm -hmm. say, this is obviously self-promotional in some way, but we acquired Meetup um, a few yeah. months ago because we were looking for this way to, to reach more people and um, working with them, you know, their work is, um, is in getting people who are not gonna always be inside of the same you know, we workspace, but are distributed across the world to come together around shared interests. Yeah. And obviously they, they connect people in so many diverse ways, yeah. but this is something that I think in, we all need more. I mean, you guys are here, you're attending this event. Um, I right. think you hopefully value human connection, but it is something that I think we need to work harder on, pulling people together, sitting face to face, talking in real life, yeah. having multi-dimensional connections uh -huh. is super important when it's so easy to go down a narrow path in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Like if you mm -hmm. find a relationship in digital media and it's around a singular point of view and then you align around that, mm -hmm you're missing so much richness in, a, in, in people that, um, yeah. that you need in order to, to have a, a real connection, a meaningful yeah. connection. Absolutely. You know, you're making me think about, actually because of one of the other questions about, uh, about diversity here and other things, you're making me think about just what's lost when you don't have the physical interaction when it comes to culture. Um, so Kehende Wiley, this name means something to you, maybe, and others in the room. He created the, uh, one of the portraits of the Obamas recently. Uh, and I'm thinking about him on this point because of this fact. My first published article was about this artist, and I was asked to write about this then unknown artist. Okay, Kehende was 28, I was 24, I was curating at MoMA. Um, in a digital context, someone sent me an email and said, can you go to the Brooklyn Museum and check out the work? I think it's interesting, but just write 300 words, very, very short. And I went to the Brooklyn Museum show I wrote back to my editor and I said, well, I don't know what work you're seeing online, but in person, this cannot be 300 words. This needs to be much larger. And so I, I had never published an article before, but I spent so many late nights, the guards still remember me at MoMA. <laughs> I've been really, like, late, late, until three and four in the morning, trying to make a case for this young artist. And because of what I'd seen in person, I was just knocked out by the work. And I wrote this piece and it wasn't, as digital as it is now, so I submitted the piece, and three weeks later I was asked to come down to the magazine, Art in America, and they showed me that his, the story had landed on the cover, the piece I'd, I'd written. Wow. And that was because I saw the work in person. I, there was no way I could understand its scale, its potency, its power. And I, I think there's got to be a, a way in which we start to finally merge the aesthetic force that can come in the physical environment and the digital. I'm looking to you to do that kind of work. <laughs> well, that, that's an, you know, one of the things that we're actually engaging in even more is bringing culture into our buildings and yeah. trying to figure out how we can have more conversations around um, different topics. And mm -hmm. I think we're really lucky to have, you know, this network of spaces and we'll, we'll get better at using them. Yeah. Um, but I think there's this time where many people, you leave university, yeah and you no longer have a place of congregation, mm -hmm. you know? Like there's, mm -hmm. there aren't that That's many right. models that exist in the world for like human beings to come together yep. and yep. talk. And That's you know, right. coffee shops are one, you know, there was a time when mm -hmm. the coffee shop was thought of as a third place, you know? Yeah. Now many yeah. of the coffee shops are like optimized for get your cup of coffee as fast as you possibly can and get, yeah. you know, on to work. And, uh, and I think there are few institutions that, um, again, mm -hmm. beyond universities where people mm -hmm. think about, hey, this is a place I go for, for discussion about interesting um, topics. And yeah. so I think, um, again, I think we're at the beginning of, of our role in this, but it is something as a brand and as a company mm -hmm. we want to promote. We want to be out in the world saying, 
these interactions matter. Mm -hmm. Taking the time to uh, meet people in real life, to talk mm -hmm. about interesting topics is something that, it just matters to humanity, yeah. you know? Absolutely, no, absolutely. So and it's part of the, the foil to our digital embrace, right? And reminding ourselves that we can't move past the technology of the human soul. We're always going to be moved by the physical encounter. We can't move past, say that one more time, we oh. can't move past the technology of the human soul. Yes. That's a really good one, I'm gonna start. <laughs> Let me pretend I said that first. It's all yours. <laughs> um, that's really, technology, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see what else do we have here. Uh, what are your recommendations on how to find the best hires for culture? How important is culture if the talent is there? Uh, I love that question because uh, like any company that's growing, we're hiring a lot of people, and it is hard to, you know, there's always this question of like culture fit, right. you know, and right. how do you right. ascertain in a couple of interviews what yeah. someone's soul uh, yeah. is yeah. made of? Yeah. It's very difficult. I mean, we have values that we express um, pretty explicitly, you know, on our website, and um, we do encourage a discussion of that mm -hmm. with, with new team members. Um, obviously, people being connected to us as a company in an authentic way uh, is meaningful. But mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, uh, it's hard to get people to to reveal themselves, and especially you know people who are practiced in you know interviewing, and they may have had four other interviews that week. Right. You know what what do you, what can you ask them? Talking to you, I'm thinking maybe we ask what um, art are you into? Ah. You know what music inspires you? Ah. Is there a painting you love? Uh, I might say something. Yeah, I think that would, and asking the same question of the, of the different interviewees could actually help you in a little data collection way, consider what you might want to. <laughs> right, selfishly, we can like make our own, uh, we might decide what art to buy um, based on the future market um, for the work. Um, when and how did we work culture fail? Yeah. How did you work to fix it? Obviously, failure yeah. is uh, something to learn from. Absolutely. Uh, people are Absolutely. You know, taking pride in failing, so I think we should be comfortable um, revealing that. I would say for us, mm -hmm. you know, for many companies, when you go from the being all in the same room, where mm -hmm. you're, you know, 100 people, you know everyone's face, you're familiar, you get that multi-context relationship because you're mm -hmm. seeing people. And when you get past that and you get to 200 and then 1,000, uh, it becomes harder to know everyone, to understand people, um, just by seeing people around, you know? That, that ends up not being enough. And so I think, again, for me, this is why I indulged in this process at that time. When, we, when I was like looking around and I'm like, I don't know half the people here. You know, that made me feel super uncomfortable because if I don't know you and I don't understand you, then I'm probably not doing the best to serve you as a, as a company, as a culture, and helping you achieve your best self. Mm -hmm. And so, um, to me, that's why, I mean, that's why these discussions became yeah. so interesting to me is we have to figure out new ways to connect with people that, that has a, it's not always going to be one-to-one. -one. We mm -hmm. have to move people mm -hmm. with new methods, exactly. you know? Exactly. And any, any successful culture that doesn't identify a moment of seeming failure is just not telling the truth. <laughs> you know? I think that this is, this is the main finding, that innovation comes from what other people would call failure and what a group calls a learning opportunity. I don't think that you can learn without feeling, at least internally, as if there's a gap between where you are and where you want to go. And that's really all that failure is, just an external word we apply to that. And so in your case, you're finding that scale is one of, the, one of these things, and I think it will constantly put you in this position of being on really what's just the road to mastery, always feeling as if there's a new, a new near win that one needs to contend with, something that didn't quite measure up to what you thought simply because you're growing so quickly and because your ambitions are shifting. You know? Awesome, so we're out of time. Yeah. I'm gonna think of this as a total failure. <laughs> that way I can grow from it. Yeah. Um, I hope you feel the same. I feel the same. And um, the same. I'm glad that you all joined us for this. If you walk out feeling anything, um, it's that you have lots of room to grow. And if you're on a path towards it, that's the best place you can be. So thank you guys for being here. And thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you, again.